G'day Fools, Scott Phillips here. I'm the Motley Fools Chief Investment Officer, as you likely know. You also know you tend to only hear from me when things go badly, at least in this format, in this forum. And so, yep, here I am. When I say things go badly, of course, I'm not talking about the long-term future of the stock market, even the medium-term future, hopefully, of the stock market. But I am talking about the volatility we've seen in shares over the past week or so at a macro level, and frankly, for the last six months or so, when it comes to some particularly uh, beaten down growth companies, uh, so-called tech stocks, um, you know the ones, the ones that have been really hit hard by changing expectations of the financial markets. And I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of days in on media platforms around the country, uh, radio, TV, internet, podcasts all over the place, uh, because people are saying, what's happening? What now? And I just want to come and bring it to you directly. Uh, as I said, I don't want to become one of those guys, you know, if you see me talking, you know something's wrong. Uh, we'll try and do a bit more of this maybe outside that. But for now, what basically we thought was it's important that I share some thoughts with you, that uh, the team at The Fool and myself, we said, you know, it's, it's important that we get out there and simply give you some context, give you some feedback, give you something to uh, at least our perspective. I'm not going to promise you I know exactly what's going on or what will happen, but uh, we wanted to give you my perspective just to share some thoughts about what's happening on the stock market. It will also talk a bit about the, major, the, the macro economy too, by the way, so, so hang around for that for a few minutes. Um, so there's volatility, right? Yeah, no surprise, Sherlock. Uh, we had a big fall on the Australian markets on Tuesday. We're having a big fall today, Wednesday. I'm recording this halfway through the day, one o'clock or so on Wednesday afternoon. The ASX 200 is down uh, about 1% close enough to. And so a lot of investors are wondering what's going on, what to do, uh, trying to make sense of, of the big falls. So let me try and break it down. I'll talk about the, the really sh recent past. I'll then try and put it in context and we'll talk about looking forward. The first thing, of course, is we know the market fell by 3.6% on Tuesday. as another one-ish percent at the moment, call it 4.6% over two days. Part of the Monday, or the Tuesday problem, I should say, is because the market was closed on Monday. The Wall Street uh, stock market in the US fell 2.5% on Friday night in our time. We only would have picked that up on the following Monday but of course, it was the Queen's birthday in New South Wales and the ASX was closed. The US market then fell another 4% or so on Monday night, our time. So when we opened on Tuesday, we had two days of losses to make up for. That's part of the reason the fall was so big on a single day. Now, it would have been over two days anyway, so I'm not suggesting the shares wouldn't have fallen, but it would have been less shocking, less impactful, less newsworthy had it happened over two smaller days than one big one. So there's that. Uh, we also know, by the way, on Tuesday, the market fell as much as four point, uh, sorry, 5.4% before finishing down 3.6%. So it made up 1.8% inside a trading day and was still down more than 3.5%. So big, big, big moves. The selling was indiscriminate. The selling was across the board. This is panic selling. This is people worrying about what comes next. And that's not a rational thing for markets to do. This was fear selling. Never, ever, ever believe that the so-called masters of the universe, the well-paid people in expensive suits sitting in glass panel buildings around the world, know what's going on or have more control over their emotions than you or I do. In fact, we're investors, we're long-term. A lot of the people making trades right now are either day traders, they're short-term traders, or they might even be fund managers with quarterly or half-yearly uh, expectations. So they have almost by definition, most of them, not all of them, most of them, shorter time frames than you or I. That makes their decision making more volatile, more prone to, I'll say panic, realistically. Uh, and and here's, the, here's the reason why. Look at a business yesterday like a Woolworths or a Coles and ask yourself, even if the worst happens to the economy, and I'll get to that, are we going to buy fewer baked beans, less toilet paper, fewer nappies or cans of tuna or fruit and veg from Woolies or Coles? Almost certainly not. And yet those shares fall. And you're saying, well, it doesn't make a whole heap of sense, does it? Maybe on interest rates, but I'll get to that. Overall, when there's indiscriminate selling, it's a reasonable assessment uh, or judgment to simply say, hey, obviously the market's just not thinking clearly right now. And most of the time you should ignore the market's movements even more when it's having periods of real exuberance or real pessimism and panic. So I want you to put the last couple of days aside. Easy to say, but I want you to do it anyway. Uh, and let's look at the bigger picture. You and, I, you and I know what's happening with prices around the country, and we hear what's happening around the world. We saw Governor Philip Lowe from the RBA on ABC last night say that he expects inflation to be at 7% by the end of the year. That means whatever you bought for 100 bucks on January 1, 
It's going to cost you $107 on average on December 31. And unless you've got uh, a whole lot of savings, you either have to save less because everything costs more, or you have to buy less because prices have gone up. If you've only got $100 to spend, you can't buy $107 worth of goods, can you? You've got to buy less of it. And so we know the impact that's having around the world on people's purchasing power, and it's a, it's a real issue. To combat that, we therefore know that central banks, including our RBA, but the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, the US Fed, the Bank of England, U the European Central Bank, are all increasing rates to try and tamp down inflation, to try and choke off inflation effectively. They will move hard, they will move fast. It's now a coordinated global effort to try and stop inflation dead in its tracks. Yes, there is some irony that you put up prices of mortgages and business loans to stop rising prices elsewhere, but that's the tool they have. We know in the past it's been effective, it can be painful, but it's effective. And that's what they're gonna to try to do again this time around. So on one hand, we have rising prices. On the other hand, we have rising interest rates. And that is going to impact people's ability to pay off their loans. It's gonna impact the money they have to spend in the economy with what's left. If you're paying an extra 100, 200, 500, some people are saying maybe $1,000 a month for some mortgages by the end of the year if rates continue to increase. That money can't be spent in the economy on clothes and food and other things that otherwise that money might have been spent on. So yeah, the economy is going to come under stress, under strain, and we may well actually have a recession as we go through this process. Before we get to the other end, it may well uh, have dragged us through a recession to get there. I don't know whether we will. I don't make predictions. They are nonsensical. No one knows for sure. Everyone just does their best guess. The problem with best guesses is they're still guesses, right? But so, so that's important to remember. But the reality is that to, to kill inflation, the central banks are going to have to slow the economies to try and tampen down demand, which is code for taking money out, which again, if we do that sufficiently enough, significantly enough, you end up with negative growth because we simply have less GDP, which is how we measure economic growth. If there's two quarters of that, then we're in a recession as we've talked about before. Uh, I don't know if we will. And if we do, I don't know when it'll come. If I was gonna guess, I'd say towards the end of this year and early next year, but no one knows. Anything could change from here and now. Central banks could change their monetary policies. Governments could step in and do different things. Anything is possible. And that's why it's so difficult to try and make these predictions. History is littered with people who made predictions. And then when they were wrong said, well, I would have been right except that dot, 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 which is kind of the point, right? Things happen. So there's that. So what do you do? Here's the thing. People spent a long time waiting for COVID to be over before going back to invest. And at the time of recording, the ASX 200 is above the level it was before the COVID crash. In other words, we made all that back and more even after the most recent declines over the last two years, two and a bit years. So waiting for the pandemic to be over before you invested again, well, you missed the entire run up. Remember the market lost 38% between February and March 2020, made all of that back and more. If you didn't invest, you weren't invested, you sat in cash, you lost the entire upside potential during that period of time. And maybe it goes lower, maybe you get another chance, maybe you don't. But the point is, if you wait for the recession to be over, there's a very, very good chance that you miss the opportunity to get the upside. And why is that? It's because the market should be, normally is, a forward-looking mechanism. In other words, it looks forward and says, okay, I'm expecting a recession. So here's what I think shares are worth in that circumstance. By the time the recession's here, the market says, oh, I can see we're gonna get out of recession. So I'll start to bid up the shares because I see profits coming in our future. A great example of that is the travel stocks. We saw travel stocks recover far in advance of international flights being restarted in and out of Australia. Why? Because the market looked forward and said, when it happens, here's what these companies will be worth. So waiting for the recession and then waiting for it to be over almost certainly, at least historically speaking, is way, way, way too late to be investing. Now let's bring it back to where we are now. Shares have fallen meaningfully in a lot of companies and in the market as a whole. So the question is, how much further do they fall? I don't know, you don't know, nobody knows. Because maybe it's already priced in. Or maybe it goes up, maybe today's the bottom. Or maybe it goes down another 10 or 20%. No one can know. Here's the thing, you don't have to know. I've said many, many times before in many, many different forums, just do yourself a favor, grab the Vanguard index chart, Google it. It's turned $10,000, a hypothetical $10,000 invested in ASX shares in 1991, 10 grand, 30 years later, $160,000. 
despite the GFC, despite the COVID crash, despite the Asian financial crisis. Remember that? Probably not. That's probably the point. Uh, despite everything that's happened in the world in that 30-year period, the value of an investment in the ASX 200, I think it was the All Lords originally, became the ASX 200, the way the chart works. Over 30 years, 16 times your money. Now, I don't know what the next 30 years looks like. I have, I'm not going to make any promises. What I will say is that despite all of the reasons to worry over that 30-year period, that's the result. So for me, I'm staying invested. Haven't sold a single share of stock. I'm not going to. God willing, touch wood, uh, unless there are unexpected circumstances. I'm going to keep adding money to my portfolio rather than selling. Maybe I invest some money today. Maybe it's worth a little bit less tomorrow, or maybe a lot less in two months' time, or maybe it's worth more in two months' time. That's the problem. If you wait for the bottom, you're never going to find it because by the time you realize it's been the bottom, the market's already up from there. So what do you do? As I said, I'm going to continue investing. Every time I get some spare cash, I'm going to look to put it to work in the market. Not because I know that's the bottom, because I believe in the power of dollar cost averaging. I believe in the power of capitalism, of democratic capitalism. I believe in the value creation that will be achieved by companies and individuals working to find better solutions to our wants and needs. It's what's propelled the market for more than a century. Is this the last time it happens? I don't think so. And if the market has never yet, listen to this, never yet failed to get back to and then go higher than a previous high, well, the further it is from that previous high, the more upside there is available to you if, and I think when, it goes back to that high and then up even further from there. So that's not a new message, by the way. You know that. If you've seen me on here before, you know exactly. I'm a bit of a broken record on this. Why? Because of that Vanguard chart I just talked to you about before. There are, in hindsight, better and worse times to invest. There always will be. But we don't have that hindsight in advance. By definition, that's why it's hindsight. What we can do is say that over time, the market has gained about 10% on average compounded over more than a century. What we can say is over the last 30 years to the 30th of, uh, 30th of July, uh, 30th of June, I'm sorry, 2021, the ASX had gained 9.6% per annum according to Vanguard's numbers that took 10 grand and 30 years later made it 160 grand without a single other dollar being invested. Imagine if you'd invested all along that path. Imagine you'd be able to put more and more money to work during that growth, during that incline, despite the GFCs, despite the COVID crashes, despite everything else that beset the market over that 30 year period. That 16X return was achieved despite, not in the absence of, reasons to fear, reasons to worry, things that could go wrong. Is it different this time? It's always different. And yet it's not different at all. Unless this is, unless we've already seen the absolute peak of human capitalism, maybe we have, but I very much doubt it. We will see higher values for the share market, more wealth created, higher share prices, higher dividends. We will see capitalism continue to advance. If you believe that, then trying to time the market, it's a little bit silly. I know it's tempting. I know we all want to get a little bit of a better deal. I understand that. But I think for my money, I think for other people's money, perhaps, I think it's worth investing because you are harnessing the power of that democratic capitalism I just talked about. Not as a blind article of faith, but because more than a century tells us of what can be done and is still being done and I believe will likely continue to be done because of the fact, as I said, people and companies out there are continuing to try and find ways to better deliver on our wants and needs. And I think that's something we've got to keep in mind when the market has days and weeks, maybe months, maybe even years like this one. Remember, of course, the market goes down about one year out of every three. Which year is it? Is it this year? Maybe. Or maybe the loss is already in. Or maybe there's more to come. I don't know, as I said, and none of it are you. That's why you want to strip it right back. Keep it simple and put the odds in your favor. And for my mind, that is being invested all the time, not trying to time the market, but having time in the market, letting the companies do their thing and benefiting from that progress. That's what I'm doing anyway. And I hope you'll consider doing the same. Until next time, hopefully with better news, full on.